gardening for life to you tonight. You know, because I can talk about science all day long or all the stuff that can probably bore you into your dessert. But when you talk about relationships, think about who it was that first took you out and taught you how to explore your surroundings. Just think about it. I mean, I can still remember having the opportunity to go out and look in the ground and ask questions and not be immediately told an answer. Because when kids are out in the yard and you're always telling facts at them, right? And y'all work with, with kids now. So I know you experience this and you probably have a lot of little ones around you. It's easy to say, oh, this is this and this is this and this is this and oh, let's repeat it. I want to make sure you have your language skills. But what would happen if you said, what do you think it is? How are we going to find out what it is? How about touch it? How about taste it? How about experience it? How about sit here, let's just watch. That's how fascination starts. And my father was the one who taught me how to do that. That's me, many years later, and this is what I do. You know, yes, I went to school for chemical engineering. Yes, I went to school and got my double masters, da 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 But this is how I learn. Every single morning, I get up, I grab my coffee, feed the chickens, go out into my yard, and observe. Every single morning. And I don't have to do it long in order for something to teach me something. Now, I'm not going out there to check on things that I already know. I'm going out there to be surprised by something that I could never even fathom would be available to me. Just tonight, before I came on here to talk to you, I walked outside. And I just stood there. And I opened myself to the atmosphere. And the cedar wax wings are in your magnolia. The robins are bantering back and forth, fighting for purchase. That's a lesson. That's a fascination. So how do you do this? How do you get to curiosity? How do you cultivate fascination? How do you nurture wonder? Because isn't that the key? Isn't that what makes life worth living? When you can walk outside and not automatically know everything? Who wants to know everything? That's too much trouble. <laughs> so how do you learn how to watch? This is something my father taught me. My father was a quiet man. Very, very quiet man. My mother didn't let him get a word in Edgewood. So it was pretty easy, you know, he just kind of stayed quiet. And he grew up on a farm outside of Philadelphia in Chester, Pennsylvania. He had two and a half acres farm. Now it wasn't a farm to raise money to make a living. I think his father was a, a garbage man. He was a very simple family. And their two and a half acre farm fed them. It did everything for them, because those were simpler times. He was born in 24. And in 1941, when Pearl Harbor struck, at 17, he went to war. And he got trapped behind enemy lines in France and then Belgium. He was a paratrooper. Maybe that's when he got quiet because his life changed significantly as a result of that. When my father passed away in 2001, we found this little picture in his wallet of this little girl in France. And of course, you know what we were thinking, oh, we have another sister, right? <laughs> Not true. Not true. And so 
so we asked, I'm like, Mom, what, what, what is this? You know, now my father was a Purple Heart um, recipient. You know, he was Silver Star. He had all these medals, never talked about the war. Ever, never, never. You don't talk about the war. You live a good life and you do the best you can with what you've got. And that's how you're supposed to be. Okay. So we asked my father, why is this little girl's picture in his wallet? She said, at the darkest days of World War II, your father had gone into Paris and he saw this little girl and she was sitting in the middle of the street just playing. Everything around her was demolished and everything inside of her was still vibrant, was still fully alive, was still fully awake, was still fully inspired. She was clueless and he said, I knew that very moment that that's why I'm fighting this war, to create a world where that is possible for every child and I want to remain that way myself for the rest of my life. And so what greater gift could he have given his five children than learning how to cultivate the awareness of presence and the gratitude for life itself? So when I talk about garden for life, I'm not just talking about I want to garden my whole life long. I want to connect I want to connect to that fascinating opportunity that God gives us every day that lets me go out and watch something and partner with something bigger than myself in a way that enriches us both. I can't do that if I'm busy controlling it. I can't do that if I'm busy spending 99% of my time manipulating it to what I want. I must be a partner with nature and with the process of all life, whether I like it or not. Because then I'm taught, then I'm teachable. So when you learn how to watch in your garden, you start to notice the cycles. You start to notice why the blue jay is sitting on the fence with that branch. Why that branch? Why not the stuff that's over here in the leaf litter? And then, you're, then you learn that blue jays require certain branches. So if I'm raking them all up, what's that going to do for the blue jay? Right? So if I'm going to co-create a happy life for myself and this blue jay, what do I have to change in my habits, in my gardening? How to learn. <clears throat> now this is my pond. I have a 5,000 gallon pond in my yard. I only have a third of an acre, so it's not a very big property. And I live in regular suburbia, you know, all the houses right on the little street. And in my pond, I probably have about somewhere between 500 to 1,000 species uh, amount, like numbers of frogs, toads, um, newts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And every spring, I see this in my pond. Every spring. Now, most of you know this is a a, a mosquito minnow. Okay. Could be a baby koi, but it's probably a mosquito minnow. But that long chain, that long chain are toad eggs, not frog eggs. How do I know that? Because I learned how to ask, okay? And I learned how to observe frogs early in the morning and identify the difference between their calls and the string of their eggs versus the cluster of um, toads. So when you learn how to just pay attention, a whole new world opens up to you. And this is the gift 
that we give ourselves if we can embrace the opportunity of getting out of the way. Just getting out of the way and asking these important questions. How to explore. Now, I'm going to tell you, the easiest way that I explore is with that phone. You know, and we all have one, so there's no excuse that you don't have to, you can't explore too. Because for about three years, what I did was I did a meditative experiment where every morning I would go out and do my morning meditation in the garden. I would do my prayers, and then I would open myself up to whatever it was, and I would sit in one space, and I would choose a different space every day, and I would choose a different orientation <coughs> in space. Maybe now I'm over here and I'm looking up. <coughs> you know, maybe I'd climb the steps and look down, and I would just sit. Now for you, that might be a coffee moment. That might be a sip and stroll in the evening with a glass of wine. Doesn't matter. It's an opportunity for you to connect. So for me, I would take pictures. <coughs> and macro photography is an amazing um, exploration. If you've never done it, I see some heads nodding. So this is scarlet hibiscus, Texas <coughs> star, growing in a pond. Grows much better in my pond than it does in my pollinator bed. And it pollinates better. And what I have learned now is that in order for it to truly get pollinated, it needs a bumblebee. Because it needs buzz pollination. Buzz pollination is when the bee goes in and it shakes it, shakes the pollen loose. Guess what? You can't have eggplant without it. You can't have tomatoes or zucchini without it. You can't have that squash soup without it. So if I want to make sure that I've got this and I want to make sure that I'm connected and responsible, I'm gardening for life, I'm going to be gardening for bumblebees too. Because I want them to be there. I don't just want that squash soup. You know, I, I want the things that they want. I want us to look to co-create together. So I've already talked about sitting. And this is a beach primrose. I don't know if you've ever had one of these roadside moments. Have you? When you're just driving and then all of a sudden you just come upon this, oh my goodness, what is that? I've got to steal it and put it in my yard. <laughs> right? Yes. We all have them. Yeah. We all have them. We call it roadside yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you, even though I'm a Quaker and I can't lie, I have created new jobs with certain horticulture studies when I'm traipsing over somebody's field and I'm like, oh yes, I went to Garden Club in South Carolina. I'm going to go to program. And I'm so fascinated. Would you mind if I took a scientific sample? They love, throw that word in. Scientific sample. <laughs> So, so I said, and these and these grow in the in the winter. And then who can't get lost here? Who cannot get lost in those gorgeous, delicate, baby pink of the lotus flower? The most supreme flower on the planet, in my opinion. And it only and it grows six or seven feet tall. And the flower is about this big. And if you've ever been up and close, it smells divine. And it is covered in pollinators, particularly mason bees, and guess what? Carpenter bees. Those bees that everybody hates, <laughs> right? They got to have a place to live, too. Okay. Every now and then, I get a special gift. And every April, I know that gift is coming. And for me, it's this bird. This is the Louisiana water thrush. Now, it's a very 
very shy bird. And I only see it for about a week or two every year. And this bird, it's okay looking. It's pretty, you know. It's not a purple martin. It's not a, um, well, it's pretty, <laughs> right? But it's got a cool dance. It walks around the pond and it does this with his head, with his butt. It just does this all the way around the pond. So it is just like this all the way around the pond for like a week and a half. And I am just in heaven. How could you not be in heaven, right? Because you know how the, the wren is such a um, notable bird, right? You never miss it, right? Well, this one is so shy. It lives in the leaf litter. It only hunts in the water, the shallow waterfalls. That's the only time you'll see it. If you're lucky, you'll catch it trying to catch the snails. But the dance is so loud that it just, it's a lesson, right? It's a lesson. Like, I am so happy to be alive that I'm going to dance. Well, I'm dancing out there with it. I'm like, yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is fun. It's April. It is happy April. So, let's back up and talk about what's different. What's the difference between a Garden for Life garden and your traditional, out-of-the-box, garden store garden? Okay? The ABCs of garden. The ABCs of master gardening. And I am not against master gardeners. Great science. Great data. Great resources. But it's not just about taking a soil sample. It's not. It's not understanding what the NPK ratio is. There's a quiz afterwards. <laughs> it's about creating harmony, not just produce, not just beauty. You know, so funny, when I ask people, what do you garden? I asked several of you that tonight. And you're like, uh, I don't have the right answer. Okay. Well, I, I, my simple answer is I garden for life. I garden for everything. I garden for myself. I garden for you. I garden for the plants. I garden for the butterflies. I garden for the raccoons and the opossums and my chickens and the fish and da 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 da. But I garden really for relationship and connection and spiritual enrichment. Because that's what gardening can do. And all of those relationships that come out of that, like here in this room tonight, I garden for that too. I garden for you. You garden for me, whether you know it or not. Because together we make a better planet. So when we're looking to make Garden for Life gardens, we're thinking about how we can enhance life at every layer of the landscape. How can we enrich the mycorrhiza? How do the roots relate to the trees? How does the soil and the leaf litter make it a better garden, a richer garden? Why should I not put Scott's weed and feed on my lawn anymore? Why should I even have a lawn anymore? Wow, that's, that's heavy stuff. So <laughs> I'm not going to go too far down that path. Um, so we normally, you, here's, here's a fact that really upset me. The modern American landscape designer no longer learns about plants. Landscape architecture is all about hardscape. It's all about concrete products, stonework, and squares and lines. It is no longer about flow. It is no longer about balanced horticulture. What they do is they call the nurseries and they say, I need something about this tall that's kind of a medium green. That's our landscape industry. We have a responsibility to balance that as Garden Club members. So harmony, creating a pleasing and consistent whole where all of the parts dynamically work together, including you. This is what we're going for, right? And I know I know you're already saying, well, not really <laughs> though. Not really those. But guess what? All things in balance means all things in balance. Right? How do we go wrong in the Garden of Eden? We pretended to know what was better. 
So all things in balance is what we're going for. And if we want to cultivate enchantment, and I'll give you an enchantment moment if I can. Let's see if I can get it to work. Oh, nope. No, I'm going to be able to do this now. Is there a video behind it? Oh, there it is. Let's see if it'll work. I don't know if it'll play in this. There's a wonderful little interaction. That's okay if we don't see it. So when I say cultivate enchantment, I think you already know what I mean. But it's really about being stopped in your tracks and surprised by something that you never thought you would either learn, see, experience, feel, right? Or even ask. So I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you all, challenge you all. At some point, when the weather breaks or when before it does, I want you to go out and I want you to get on the ground. And I want you to sit in a plant. <laughs> And I want you to sit near the plants that have the little flowers on them, pre preferably a weed. And I want you to stay there for five minutes, bring a cup of coffee, have a glass of wine. I don't know, do a dirt party, I don't care. Just don't talk and see what you see. See what you see. You're going to see amazing things. Because gardening is not about the work that you put in to get a result. Gardening is about the relationship that you cultivate with the world around you, and it starts at home. It starts at home. Okay. So most of the time, when I go to visit somebody or I ask them about their garden, I'm like, so, you know, show me your garden. Now they have this lush landscape, and they take me to this little corner, little box, five little basil plants, a tomato. I'm like, yeah, that's lovely. What about all this? What about all this? What about the canopy? What about your ground covers? What about those wild piles? That's what I really want to explore. That's a garden too. So when you're planning a garden for life garden, you want to think about it like you're throwing a party. Okay? We're having a garden party. And everybody's invited. Every living creature. Okay? We're gonna, if we were doing a party, and this is what I've talked about before, anytime I do a party, I, I always like I'm a list maker, right? Left, left brain kicks in. Who am I inviting? What's the menu? What's the table settings? How are we gonna clean the house in time? Should we even clean the house because it's gonna get dirty anyway? <laughs> What's the theme of the party gonna be? Because every party has to have a theme now. It's not good enough just to get together. <laughs> we have to get together over some photo booth thing. Anyway, so now we're doing garden party with your landscape plan. And who are you inviting? You're inviting that peaceful kingdom, right? You're inviting all of the layers. And don't worry, it's in the handouts. Now, people say, OK, what, is, what are you talking about? What are herbivores? OK, think about basic science. Plants eat sun. It's the only thing on the planet that eats sun, plants. Herbivores eat plants. It's the next layer. Okay? Pollinators come in and, and make sex happen. <laughs> it doesn't want to advance on that. <laughs> but yeah, these videos are fun. Okay, so pollinators, and there's a long list of them, you know, and we all know butterflies, moths, beetles. Okay? You know what's going to pollinate that magnolia out there? Beetles. Not butterflies, not bees. Beetles. So if you're killing all your beetles, what are you doing to your magnolia? Okay. Yes, bats do pollinate, but not here. Not in South Carolina. You have to live in the desert. So maybe in California, where you came from. Um, ants, amazing pollinators. Ants pollinate by using what they call um, super um, nectaries. So if you ever look on a flower, You'll see the flower and all the stamen and the anthers up here, right? And then right underneath the flower, on the stem, there are these little wart-like things. Guess what they are? Sugar packets for ants. And do you know why they're there? 
if they feed the ant, the ant will eat that and the aphids. So you're seeing all these ants all crawling all over your passion flower, because that's a big one that has a lot of ants. And you're like, oh, I gotta get rid of all the ants. I'm like, no, the ants are doing the work for you. It, watch, learn. It's amazing what you're gonna watch just by learning. Mosquitoes pollinate orchids. Not in your yard, probably, but they do pollinate orchids. So everything has a purpose. Okay, so now we're building the cycle, right? The sun, the, the plants eat the sun, the bugs eat the plants, they pollinate, then we have more plants and then have fruit, and now we can eat. But guess what else is happening? In that same, as things are being built up, things are being taken down. And that's where the detrivores came in. Now the predators are going to be next, but the detrivores are the things that are least understood in a garden. These are the things that are working all underneath in your leaf litter. It, they're the earwigs, you know those little pinchy bugs? Yeah, you're big in that face. Yeah, yeah, my chickens love them. Absolutely love them, okay? They're the wood lice. You know them as roly-polies, right? Have blue blood, cyanide in their blood. That's why they don't get eaten, okay? Um, ear, yeah, fly larva. Huge, huge, massive sugar packets for predators and birds. So this, this is what's feeding your bird population, is your detrivores. So that's getting balanced by the birds, but while it's happening, it is also creating the soil. Do you know that there's really no such word as humus? There's no such thing as humus. Humus is like some frozen spot on this ever de decaying process. But we think that, oh, we buy it in a bag. You know, no, it's neutralized. It's not real. There's a constant evolution and de-evolution of gardening. That's what gardening is. Predators, so that's my yard, okay? That's after a long, fun night for them, <laughs> where they, where he took her, the bigger one is her, and he took her in the pond because toads only uh, mate in water because they have to release their eggs because they don't have intercourse like we do, right? Everything gets taken out, everything gets released by the female and then fertilized by the male and it, has, it needs water to do that. It needs a turbulent mix of water to have that happen. So, and he'll stay on her for about three days. Sometimes she will drown because there are too many of him on her. And she could, yeah. And so you know why she's exhausted. <laughs> the poor thing. But without that moist leaf litter to buffer her after that hard night, <laughs> she may not survive. And she will then go under the leaf litter again and rest for about another week. So that there's this is all these things that you learn just by being in your environment. So getting back to Garden for Life. <laughs> What's on your menu, right? We already know who's invited. Everybody's invited. What's on the menu? Okay, easy peasy, native plants. Always, 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 and not just the ones that are pretty. Not just your red buds. You gotta have layers, layers and layers and layers of them. And we talk about that in the the literature that we give you. Um, you have to have edibles because you want to eat too, right? This garden is as much for you as it is for them. You are co-creating a happy life. You have to have pollen. You have to. Even if you don't need it, if you don't have any vegetables that you want to pollinate, you must have pollen. You must have a pollen source and you must have it every month of the year. Every single month of the year. Because now we have pollinators that need that food source every single month of the year. Particularly hummingbirds. Because hummingbirds are now in South Carolina all year round. Put your hummingbird feeder out when you get home. And make sure it's clear. Make sure you're not using the red stuff. We don't want to kill their liver. You must have seeds. And you must leave those seeds out all winter long. Why? Because what's happening in the oak trees and the magnolia trees right now? All the migrating birds are coming through. The warblers, 
They, they don't eat bugs in the winter unless they get a warm day. They're going to be eating seeds. They're all going to be switching to those seeds. You must have working soil, living soil. You must be able to go into your yard and scoop up a piece of dirt, a big old clump of dirt, and see white networks all through it. That's your mycorrhiza. Okay? That's that what they call the world wood web. <laughs> right? The world wood web. The interconnection between fungus and animal tissue. Okay. And you must, I, I really strongly suggest that you add some version of running water. Running water, not just bird baths, but running water. Now, if you have a bird bath and you can't put running water in, that's fine. They make these new little solar things. Buy it for like $29 and it squirts. That's enough. That's enough. And put it at all layers. Again, it's a layered approach to gardening. A layered approach. Because you need to have your ground dwellers in water. You need to have your bird feeder, um, bird bath birds in water. And you need to have bumblebees giving access to water. And the easiest way to provide access to bumblebees, predator, uh, beetles, and butterflies is to do a shallow dish of marbles or rocks and don't have the water covering the whole rock. So just have a layer, just enough, just enough for it to go on the rock and not drown to get a drink. Absolutely essential, particularly this time of year because it's the dry season. So now we're setting the table for our party. Right? We're setting the table. So we're going to focus on building areas of our landscape strategically so that we can enhance the life. And you want to think about plant communities. What you don't want, tula, 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 tula. You don't want that. Nothing in a row. You want tulips. You want boxwood. You want viburnums. You want groundsel. You want vines. You want to cover your landscape. Think about your whole yard is now your garden. So now you're, you're covering your landscape with all the layers. So what are the layers? The carbon layer, that's the dirt, right? That's the dirt and the leaf litter and the living mulch. You, at the very top is your canopy. Now this doesn't have to be your yard. There's this concept called borrowed landscaping and I use it all the time. When I bought my lot, I bought it because there's three giant grand water oaks in it that were about 75 to 85 years old. Mm -hmm. Two of them are now gone. But behind that, in my neighbor's yards, were other oak trees and other pine trees. So I had a borrowed canopy. Think about that for your common areas. There's nothing wrong with planting right over the line, right? Nobody's going to stop you. Well, maybe they will. <laughs> Do it under cover of darkness. Then your next layer, your understory layer. This is the area where we normally start gardening. Because these are the pretty things. These are the persimmon tree that you were talking about. The red bud. The dogwood. The fun stuff. The fruit trees. Right? These are the trees for you. But they are also a dense layer of shelter and nesting sites. Then you have your hedgerow. Hedgerow is a vastly underrated technique used on farms and agriculture for hundreds and hundreds of years. I'm not going to get into it, but there's a whole book on hedgerows and thickets that you need to read. Running water and a prairie meadow. Prairie meadow is your pollinators, your cutting gardens, all the other plants that you love. Okay? So, this is what we want to create. We want to create our living soil. Now, I really... This is my controversial slide, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. That's grass on the end. So if all you have is lawn, all you have is about two inches of life. Two inches, if you're lucky. And how much of your acreage is just two inches thick? Something that you might want to think about. Think it, look, all the other native plants, all the other native plants and how far they go. Most plants go down as far as they go up. 
most plants, except grass. That's your typical lawn, right? <laughs> Move into a new subdivision, that's what you get. They throw some dirt down, they call it topsoil. <laughs> and they roll out something that they call a carpet of zoysia or Bermuda or centipede. And then they just hook you. Now you're on crack for the rest of your, <laughs> the rest of your life. You're on crack. You know, every quarter, you're in the chemicals, water, blah, 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 blah. your pocketbook. Okay. So we talked about the canopy. In South Carolina, we have preferred trees for Garden for Life. And we're identifying those in our newsletter every month. But some of our best, the ones that were here before us, Oak, black cherry, hickory, walnut, pine, magnolia, okay, and sycamore. All very, very good host trees. When I say host trees, what I mean is they support more Lepidoptera species, <coughs> butterflies and moths, as well as other beneficial insects than anything else that you can plant in South Carolina. They also absorb more water, and they also absorb more carbon. A water oak, one water oak, can absorb up to 500 gallons of water a day in a flood. But we don't like them, right? Because they're messy. Okay, so in, this is a picture of my yard off season. And yes, it doesn't look very neat because I have a wild garden. I have rewilded my space. But this is the, can this is the understory layer. And you can see the borrowed landscape behind it and then all of the little volunteers. So that's what we're looking for, something that's going to draw your eye up to look through it. The top 10 trees under story, again, plum. Plum, absolutely plum. Holly, crab apple. These are all native trees that you can add to your yard. Pawpaw. You will only get zebra long-winged butterflies if you have pawpaw. Hedgerows, we're not going to go into that. And then, of course, we've got tons and tons of information. Then you build your habitats. Once you get all those layers done, that's when you add the bird feeders. That's when you add the wild piles. That's when you add the water. Can anybody tell me what that is? Dragonfly. Dragonfly. It's a dragonfly naiad. And it lives under the water 90% of its life. You had no idea. You thought, oh, it just popped up in spring right, for around six weeks. Guess what? It needs water to survive. And it is very predacious underwater. It will eat anything underwater. And it grows very well. And it'll live under there for about a year, almost. And then come out for six weeks. Okay, and here, bees. These are orchard bees. You can actually see the baby bee starting getting ready to eat its way out. These are bee boxes. So these are the habitats. And then the other thing that I always invite people to create are people-free zones. A people-free zone is that area of your yard that's kind of behind that thing over there that we don't talk about, you know, <laughs> where my husband's store says, yada, yada. <laughs> well, right next to all that, you don't take your friends over there when they come over. Right next to that, that's where you have your compost pile. That's where you have your brush pile. So in my yard, nothing leaves. I'm going to say that again. In my yard, nothing leaves. When it gets cut, it gets taken to the people free zone. When it gets mowed, it gets added to the compost pile. Okay? When it gets pruned, it creates habitats. And I don't touch those habitats all year. Because that's where my beneficials, that's where the beetles and the pollinators and the leaves, that's where they're living right now. And maybe some other things. <laughs> okay. So, there's lots of books, lots and lots of books. Okay? But one of the best things that's going to teach you how to garden for life is to be in this room. To be with other people that are going to nurture you 
to be better stewards of your Garden for Life landscape. Now, South Carolina has an amazing collection of educators right now. This two years is all about teaching you how to garden, teaching you how to bring gardening back into your garden club. Remember we're a garden club, right? We actually garden. We all join the garden club for different reasons, and I'm not going to tell you that, you know, that that's not a valid reason. That's why we have 501c4s and c3s, and Yvonne can tell you all about that if you want to know. She's the 501c3 chairman. But when we're talking about joining a garden club, most people, we did a study, most people join garden club for one of three reasons. Their friends drag them to a meeting, right? Where all their friends are there, right? They have just moved here, and they don't know how to grow their tulips. <laughs> Darn it. Right? So I'm going to go join a garden club, and I'm going to learn everything but gardening. <laughs> Third reason is you're already a gardener. And you just want to be around cool people that get it, that get why you're stopping on the side of the road to rescue that half-dead orchid, because you know you can bring it back to life, right? And you know that you're going to go into your neighbor's yard and steal that roadside idea and use it at a table of design tonight, right? You know, right? And we do cool things. We're cool people. We're change agents. Think about that. Think about what we have done as a community of women, mostly, for the last 90 years. We're about to celebrate our 90th anniversary, and we have cultivated so many amazing relationships in South Carolina, I can't even begin to tell you. So we teach, in Garden Club, we teach environmental stewardship. Next week, we have Environmental Study School at Clemson, three-day course, learning sustainability practices. Guess what, at the very end of that, you're gonna meet Doug Ptolemy. The guy that wrote the book on bringing nature home. Really awesome things. We have a gar garden study course, which you can actually, like Master Gardeners, we actually invented the Master Gardener program, and the Master Gardeners took it and named it their own. But it came from Garden Club. These are plums, by the way. These are sand plums, a native plum that grows in Charleston, in my yard. All these pictures are stuff that we've done together in Garden Club. This is a community outreach project that my garden club did. We go into an inner city school. It's its community center called St. Julian Divine. And we had a bug day. Because most inner city kids only know one bug. That's not the one everybody likes. And they're afraid of them. And they're afraid of dragonflies. So what we did was we raised 60 different types of insects. Aquatic, aerial, ground, and we brought them all. And we brought them in a safe environment so that they could study them up close and touch them and feel them. And you're like, no way. Right. <laughs> no way. I am not to, right? I collected these predaceous beetle, like the, like the larva, and I started out with 12 of them. And by the time I got to the class, I only had one. He had oh, eaten gosh, everything oh in the oh, oh. Well, look at this kid's face. Look at this kid's face. This is, this is giving the gift of gardening. This is giving the gift of curiosity and fascination and wonder and enchantment and confidence. Because she's not afraid. We built a garden at Patterson Academy. We were talking about it earlier. This is a garden for multiply disabled children that are on the autism spectrum. Because Garden Club allowed us to become a 501c3, we could do a $45,000 project basically for free because people gave us money to do it. And we partnered, we cultivated relationships with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and the school and the local businesses and they all partnered in. And we created a garden where kids that do not let you touch them can smell rosemary and suddenly make contact. It gives me chills to remember what we did that day. I still remember Jasmine. She actually let me hold her hand. And this is a kid that's tactically defensive. And it was all because of rosemary. And it's different. For this kid, it's mint. And for this kid, it's oregano. Garden Club does that. OK? 
okay? And then we get to be creative. You know, a couple years ago, somebody called me and said, I heard you're a floral designer. I'm like, sure, I am. I compete, I'm a flower show judge, what do you need? They're like, well, we're doing this movie set on the, in McClellanville, it's called Sophie and the Rising Sun. You might have seen it on Netflix. And I'm like, okay, and you want me to do flowers for that? Sure, sure. So I show up, well, they want me to create the rose garden <laughs> <laughs> on the side of the house, <laughs> right? So within about three days of work, and that just has to be sweating, the entire landscape, the entire house was covered in a fake arbor of roses and ligustrum and iliagnus and we had to wire every one of those roses on there. They were going to like 5,000 roses. So when you see the movie, I'm not in the credit. So we do floral study. We have fun. Y'all, every one of you is working with kids somehow. Every year we do this amazing youth symposium at Riverbanks, and we give all these kids contest win, you know, awards, and then they get to be in the zoo all day, and they get to play with hissing roaches and little <laughs> bugs and animals and stuff. That's us. And we have adventure. In Garden Club, we went to Belize last year. Um, I got to play with the Angelas and <coughs> big things and got to crawl all over Aztec ruins. <coughs> this year we're going to Chelsea Flower Show. We're going to Newport, Rhode Island for their garden tour. In, a, in um, October we're going to the Atlanta Botanical Garden in Oakland Cemetery, an amazing place. Do some shopping. <laughs> but to me this is the best. This is the absolute best. The reason that Yvonne is with me tonight is because of Garden Club. You know, she's not in my Garden Club. I'm not in her Garden Club. She's in one of those big Garden Clubs, like 425 member Garden Club, wow. the largest in the state. Mine is like 28, complete opposite. Two different flavors of Garden Club. But we met at Flower Show School. And just like y'all met each other over some project or some adventure or some lecture, or maybe tonight. And these are friendships that last a lifetime. I would not trade these friendships for anything in the world. These are the relationships that Garden Club gives us. Then, if that's not enough, you get grants, you get awards, you get contests, you get 501c3 donation status, you get district impact. You've got your district director right here. She brings all, and your co-directors, and her job is to bring you all together, like tonight. Because why? Because together we do more. And when we join district by district, we do more at the state level. We're bringing back the wildflower program on the highway, y'all. We're going to do it. We're going to need your help. And then we have national impact. And, of course, we're going to give you lots of publicity because I'm a social media crazy person. <laughs> Just kidding. I am. I'm all over. And then, you know, it's weird. This is one of those intangible things that I want to tell you about Garden Club that most people don't realize. If you are looking to keep your brain alive and vibrant, join our board. I know that sounds crazy. We have so many amazing leaders in South Carolina. Do you know that our board is 85 people strong? We have 85 people and everybody has a passion that they bring to the board and every one of them works together to make it happen. We do anything, anything you name it. You're into butterflies, we got a butterfly chairman. You're into grants, we got a grants chairman. You're into writing your congressman, we can help you do that. And we'll train you how to do that. And on the first Friday of every month, we talk about it on a conference call. And we have a subject every month that we talk about. We are all about making you be better doing what you do. So, that is not the real me. <laughs> but that is the garden club me. <laughs> right? So, if that kid that you saw down in the dirt with her sandals and her beach hat can be this person, what can Garden Club do for you? Thank you.
for 2020. I think she maxed out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.